two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast with James and Mark on this uh grey and drizzly Friday but we've got the cheery sound of children playing in the distance which we sometimes have about this time if we record because you're next to a nursery Mark. Yes they're, they're, they're gambling and frolicking in the meadow. Gambling? Yeah well not that kind of gambling. No. <laughs> and uh, you, uh, you've survived moving house which is well known to be one of the most stressful periods in anyone's life. How did it go? It is, it is stressful, but I find throwing money at things makes things less stressful. So um, we threw quite a lot of money at some removal people, and they moved us. Um, they pat, even came in and packed everything up, put it in the back of a truck, and uh, delivered it to, to new rooms in the new house. And it's been pretty good, actually. It's been quite straightforward. The only issue now has been finding things in boxes, which we is obviously kind of a perennial problem for that, especially given, as, as we record this, I'm off on holiday tomorrow. So... Uh, um, packing everything for the kids, especially, is going to be a challenge, I think. But um, yes, as this, uh, you know, as uh, in, in a couple of days' time, I'm hoping to be relaxing on a beach in Tenerife, so uh, with a the pina that, colada in, in one hand and, a, and my Kindle in the other, probably. Yeah, well, that's a really good way of doing this. So you sort of get through the darkest moments of your move, knowing that next week it'll all be a distant dream uh, as you're on the beach. Your, we should say that you write in your office, I think, in Salisbury, don't you? So I think for some people who are in a habit and it takes quite a while to get yourself into a place where you work regularly and write regularly to, to move house could be quite disruptive I think to that routine but you've got this you're insulated from that to an extent well I am but on the other hand um I've got a, a house to unpack so this is the first day this is Thursday as we record this and I've been at the house every day this week I didn't write last week either so I haven't written a word for about 10 days now you've probably lost it now yeah, it, the it's, the moment has passed. Um, so yeah. it's that's okay. I'm fairly I'm relaxed. With, I've I've got to the stage with the book I'm writing that it's kind of at, at the eighty thousand word point. So it's kind of long enough now, and a little bit of a um, a break from the manuscript can sometimes make it easier to uh, approach it again when when you come back. So I'm not too concerned about that. I'll um, I won't do any next week. So it'll probably be about three weeks of writing, which may be the longest I've been without writing for about six years. Um, I'll be. I'll look forward to getting back into the swing of things again. Good. Okay. Uh, we've got one parish announcement before we get into today's interview, which is an exciting interview ahead of us. Um, and that is that um, we've rather generously been giving away these SPF mugs. Have I got mine? Sorry. You've got yours. You've got yours. Got there mine. you go. Uh, to our gold Patreon subscribers and I want to give fair notice we hinted at this a little while ago that we are going to switch to giving pins away um, simply it was costing like $20 I think odd to send a mug to somebody in the States and um, uh, economic wise it was obviously turns out to be an introductory offer we'll still hold the mugs around for the very special guests uh, but the Patreon gold subscribers um, are going to be getting a pin in the future uh, which is you know a rarity and something to it to be had and be perfect for those international gatherings that we have occasionally so we can identify each other uh, we'll bring a few in our pockets on those occasions as well uh, however fair notice so we'll give it another week or so so it's now the 23rd of february as this goes out so we'll say um, at the end of February, so actually not a whole week, um, you will have the opportunity still to become a gold level Patreon subscriber and you will get a mug. From March onwards, it's going to be a pin and there'll be a qualifying period for that as well. So you've got seven days left to join us uh, on patreon.com forward slash SPF podcast if you want to support the podcast and be the proud owner of an SPF mug. It was the golden age of mugs. His it's coming to a close. Coming to a close. And they'll obviously increase in value over time. Okay, so asking you about your, um, your your office, because I saw it's slightly unusual um, in that you do have an office away from the house. I've got an office in my back garden, but a lot of people work in their pyjamas on their bed. A very typical answer, actually, when I ask people in interviews is, where do you write? And people often say, I write on my bed, um, just lying there. So we're talking about this army of people who are making money 
in their pyjamas. And that's what this man is all about. This is Chris Ducker. Now, he's uh, a Brit, a very proud Union uh, Jack-wearing Brit, uh, actually lives in uh, the Philippines, where he's built up a, a huge business uh, of virtual assistants. But he's much more interested in... Uh, uh, and you as a brand, you as your own company doing your own thing. Now, he's a huge advocate of this lifestyle. He's a very um, uh, gregarious character and he's very enthusiastic for this new economy that's happening, that's taking over uh, the traditional economies and is under the radar as far as, far as most politicians and everyone else are concerned. What he's noticed is that self-publishing authors are the single biggest group of youpreneurs, as he calls them, these individuals who build a business around themselves. And uh, uh, he's uh, very interested in our world. He's all over a self-publishing form. He wants to know everything about what we're doing. He's very keen on this. Uh, actually, of course, he's published his first book and he's, of course, self-publishing it. He had a publisher before, but he's self-publishing this because he's woken up to all of that, of course. So let's hear from Chris Ducker, uh, all the way over in the Philippines. He's actually moving back to the UK very soon to quite close to me here in Cambridge. So hopefully we'll hear and see a lot more for Chris in the future. But he's a great bloke to listen to, quite motivational. So we'll hear from Chris and then Mark and I will have a chat off the back. So Chris Ducker, welcome back to the Self Publishing Formula podcast. Now, people might not know because there aren't quite enough Union Jacks behind you that you are British. <laughs> you need something, something more. The, <laughs> I think that's great. You've picked it up straight away. I, I, well, actually, the funny thing is, is that, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, I call myself the self-proclaimed proudest Brit doing business on the internet, right? That's kind of been my, my fun little thing for a, a few years now. But over the, over the years, people have actually sent me these union chat things. So right. the teapot that you see over my shoulder here, that was actually sent from somebody in Canada. Okay. <laughs> All the way to the Philippines with the Union Jack on it. So uh, are the Canadians yeah. still our subjects, though? I can't remember. I, th I believe they are. I think they are. I think the Queen's head is still <laughs> on their stamps. Okay. Um, look, uh, people will rem remember you last time, and you made a big hit and an impression the first time you came on the podcast. And uh, something interesting Thank has you. happened since then uh, with you, which is that you have uh, published a high-profile book, uh, having been traditionally published in the past. Here's the book. Uh, the Rise of the Youpreneur, you've decided to self-publish it. So we're going to talk a bit about that. But also, really, the reason you're on here, Chris, is you can talk to me and people who are writing books and building their brand and trying to sell um, their books to make a career because that's what you do, right? You you talk to people about turning themselves into a business, into a brand, and that's what this book's all about. It is, and that's exactly what a youpreneur is it's somebody who builds a business based around them their personality obviously their experience what they can offer other people and the people themselves that they want to serve and that's what being a youpreneur is all about so you know in the book we talk a lot about um becoming future proof and uh, you know building your own youpreneur ecosystem of which obviously a book or several books um, is part of that ecosystem in terms of positioning yourself as an expert, getting your message out there en masse and all that kind of stuff. Um, this, I, I genuinely believe this. Uh, you know, this was a pivot that happened for me around 2014, which is when I sort of coined the phrase Youpreneur. We didn't open the Youpreneur community doors until September 2015. Um, but since the day I did that, uh, I truly believe this is now going to be my life's work going forward. And to put this into you know like clear perspective, I own several businesses. Own I don't run them myself. I get people to come in and do it for me. So I build them up, and then I kind of step away and let them you know run the business up. Multi seven figure, several different businesses, over four hundred and fifty employees full time. Um, but this is the stuff that I love doing more than anything else. I have never been happier in my 15, almost 15 years as an entrepreneur as I am right now working with youpreneurs. Yeah, okay. Well, let's talk about the book first of all. So this decision to self-publish, where did that come from? Um, good gosh, now there's a rabbit hole. I mean, really, I was your typical kind of rookie first-time author. Uh, with virtual freedom 
Although I didn't take the first deal that came my way, uh, I did put a proposal together. I did get an agent. We did ship it and sh rather shop it around a little bit. Uh, we actually have four offers off of uh, 16 publishers that were uh, contacted. So a very good ratio. Um, if, if you take into consideration the four-hour work week got turned down 20 odd times you know before somebody picked it up so very proud of that fact we we went ahead and we we got a publisher uh in the united states to publish the book and it came out and you know i did not realize at the time uh that i had fundamentally sold you know my life away in regards to this book i'd sold my international rights away i'd sold my audiobooks you know, audiobook rights away, um, ebook, paperback, doing fine, audiobook. They pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed right after the book came out saying, we've got to get an audiobook done, we've got to get it done, we've got to get it done. I was already touring the US keynoting to promote the sales of the book. And uh, they fundamentally made the decision for me to go ahead and hire a voice talent to do the book who was horrifically bad. I mean, like extraordinarily terrible at what he was doing. Um, and obviously, you know, I try to put the spin on it. Well, it's a book about delegation and outsourcing. So I delegated it <laughs> kind of right. thing. You know what I mean? So, you know, there was a lot of issues. And by the time that I'd got my, you know, international rights back, it was too late. The book was too old. It only ever went in the Chinese, uh, Chinese and Japanese. Um, and, you know, it really, it, this book should have been in 10 plus languages easily. Um, and, you know, generally, the, the main reason why I decided to self-publish Rise of the Upener is because I wanted to retain one hundred percent control over the entire process right the way down from design to distribution to who we were going to use for print on demand to the fact that i can you know work with private printers to print that beautiful hardcover copy that you've got uh you know if you know there, there's so many different reasons why but mainly because i wanted to i wanted to retain 100 percent of the rights and 100 percent control yeah, so there's a, a, a creative argument for that. I completely understand that. And uh, it goes hand in hand, I guess, with the financial side is instead of getting whatever you signed up for, 10%, Clearly, 8%. I mean, yeah, there's clearly a financial hand in it as well. I mean, you know, the self-publishing uh, author royalties are, are way, way uh, tastier than the more traditional ones. But, you know, I, I said it when I, when I first, you know, wrote and, and launched Virtual Freedom, I said that, I didn't write the book to get rich. You know, in fact, actually, my good friend Chris Brogan once told me many, many years ago, you don't write a book to get rich, you write a book to get busy. And he's 100% right, 100% right. And so what it did is it, 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 was, it enabled me to grow my personal brand even further, to get paid ridiculous amounts of money for consulting gigs all around the world, literally. And it enabled me to um, double the revenue of one of my businesses, one of my outsourcing businesses. So it did get me busy and it did make me a lot of money, but not necessarily from the book sales itself. Now, with Rise of the Youpreneur, that's a different ball game. And we are already being very serious in the way that we're planning to, you know, not only launch this, and I'm not sure when this will be going live, I'm assuming it's around launch time. Uh, but by the time this comes out, the book is probably going to be out as well. But I'm not doing this for a year or two of sales. I mean, this is going to be a book that it could actually fundamentally be my last kind of business how to manual, quite frankly, uh, we might update it, we might expand on it, you know, that kind of thing in the future. But uh, I, I do feel like uh, financially, this is also going to become quite uh, an important mainstay for for revenue on an annual basis as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's quite a personal book, as you'd expect. Uh, from you as a, a, always um, talking about putting your brand first, yourself first. And um, if I remember rightly, you talk about the transition from the old world of business to the new one. I've kind of done that as well. I've got a video production business, which is still going in the background that does feel very, very different from what you and I do now. 
and yeah there was it's like almost he- like we're we're getting away with murder aren't we really yeah. on a daily basis we're making money in our pajamas <laughs> is how i like to uh, call the upreneur um it's which is the subtitle i think of uh, this world that we live in um but that was yeah. that thing about you know putting yourself in the back that's it putting yourself in the background making getting getting out of the way of the business is that the expression i think that it was drummed into you when you started your traditional businesses yep. and now getting in the way of your you are the business is that's kind of fundamentally different yeah, that's it. I mean, that's I, I think I, I talk about that in, in the introduction of the book. And it's, you know, it, it, it didn't hurt me. You know, the old fashioned way of building a business, it didn't hurt me. I built, you know, several very successful businesses. Um, but I, I did realize that what after a certain period of time, what was happening was that, and it became very apparent to me pretty quickly that whenever... I would make a sale, so to speak. People were doing business with me personally way before they were ever doing business with one of my companies, regardless of what you know company they were getting involved with. And it was that personal brand that was already being built that I didn't really kind of go out to build on purpose. It just kind of unraveled and happened over a period of time. Um, and then it was around sort of mid-2012, I had back surgery. I was on my back for a little while recovering um, and it really started to get me thinking about, well, you know, we've got at that point, we have probably 200 and something employees and, uh, you know, we're doing, you know, almost multi seven figure. What can we do to continue to grow this business, but also kind of remove me from it? I'm getting tired of working these longer hours, et cetera, et cetera. And that was when we really kind of went full blown onto the personal brand element of things. And it did nothing but good things for the old business as well as all the new one. So it just goes to show you things have changed. And this is the reason why I love the Upreneur business model so much is that things are going to change again. They will keep changing. It's called evolving. And, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a referendum or a president or, you know, some other kind of massive economic, you know, downturn or whatever. I believe when you build the business of you, as I call it, that you ultimately become future proof because you are about as in control of your business as you possibly can be. And there's no better, there's no better example of the Youpreneur business model than an author. There just isn't. Yeah, the self-published author sitting at home, uh, building their business. Now they do find we do find as a you know in our community we know that there's a lot of different personality types. But one personality type that does occur fairly often is an introvert um, in in the author community. And mm-hmm. I think for some of them they will look at what you're preaching, if you like. That's not the right word, but you're, what you're talking about and think. I'm going to struggle with that. I'm going to struggle putting myself first and foremost. Well, you must come across people who have this question all the time. Yeah, all the all the time, almost daily. Um, and the fact is that if you really, really don't want to be, you know, center stage in your business, and this model is not for you, that's simple. Um, however, I would, I would, you know beg to differ uh, that I believe that, you know, there are many, many introverts that are not as introverted as they actually think they are, Um, particularly people like, you know, creatives in in some way, shape or form. And I would class an author as a creative, obviously. Um, And once they get a little bit of notoriety and once they get a few, uh, you know, a few nice uh, eyeballs on their work and things start to spread a little bit for them and they're being interviewed on some podcasts and all that kind of stuff, the intro, you know, that introvert slowly but surely does start to drip away. Now, I'm not saying, and I know that, you you know, we have a mutual friend with Joanna Penn who classes herself as an introvert, yet she has no problems getting up on stage to teach her craft. And that, you know, that's absolutely fine. Now, I'm not an introvert. I'm an extrovert. I love all the attention, right? But that doesn't mean that I don't have introvert moments from time to time where I do want to be on my own, where I don't want to have anybody around me, where I don't need the eyeballs or the attention. So I think it kind of goes both ways a little bit. But ultimately, if you really, really know deep down inside of you that you're not comfortable with the eyes being on you, as part of the mainstay in your business, then this is not the model for you. You can carry on hiding behind, you know, a pen name or or whatever the case may be. But I do believe if you want to build a business properly, 
then you've got to do it in in person to a certain degree and that means you you do have to be a little bit center stage yeah and i guess this talks more specifically to non-fiction authors um who are a group yes. who increasingly yeah. we, we know we want to make sure we are we are serving on this podcast as well as uh, the multitudes of fiction authors uh uh, that are out there and you often do hear complaints from non-fiction authors that they have a slightly different task in front of them but here you are Chris Duck you are a non-fiction author self-publishing your book so you're a perfect example so let's talk a little bit about your approach to this how are you marketing this book how are you going to get it out there okay so at the time of recording this we're in the middle of January um, the official launch is February 20 um, we are not doing a, a big kind of huge uh, that that will be the first order calling right there's yes. the first 1000 book bulk buy right there i'd love um, to show it to you because it's my union jack phone but um i can't bring it into shop because it, I, i've got one of them where's mine <laughs> I, i'm not joking i actually i have one my wife bought it for me in hong kong I, i'm actually quite sure where it is her majesty could be calling at any time there you go and i, I don't have the phone next this to me oh, phone. No, i've got the same You've one got the same I've phone got the same bloody phone it's even That's got great. a little gpo sticker on it from uh, 1920. <laughs> I know, I've pulled the okay, plug out, which is a, a good thing. Okay. Good, good, good. Sorry, um, we're, we're, we're yeah, helping so, our friends in the non-fiction sphere. No, it's fine. So, we, we, you know, ultimately, I'm not going for a great, big, huge kind of pre-order campaign like a lot of people do. Um, the book will probably realistically be up a few days before Feb 20 on Amazon. Uh, we got to make sure everything's working properly, obviously. Um, and come Feb 20, that's when all the real action will take place. We're, we're putting in place a pretty good campaign for the first two weeks of the book's life. So that last week of Feb and the first week of March. So yeah, I, 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 uh, you know, I want to make it very clear. We're not going for like a New York Times bestseller thing or anything like that. Um, I truly believe that this book has the legs to sell for years and years and years, particularly if we update it, if we expand it at some point in the future. Um, and on the flip side of that, however, with that long term approach to it as a title, the flip side of that is we've got to make a splash. You have to. You only get one chance to launch something, right? Whether it be a book or a podcast or a course or, you know, whatever it is. So we want to make a big splash with it. So um, the one thing that worked very, very well for me with Virtual Freedom was uh, a podcast tour. And so I have lent um, on a lot of my influencer buddies in you know the online entrepreneur space, um, and uh, I'm doing a, I'm going to be doing a lot of podcast interviews with them. And when I say a lot, probably realistically like 15 or so. Um, I did a lot more than that for Virtual Freedom, and I realized quite frankly that with a lot of them I was kind of spinning my wheels, to be frank. Um, so just kind of really picking and choosing the the audiences a little bit more clearer this time being a little bit more concise um and then on on top of that we have obviously uh you know some articles going up on on some big name sites like entrepreneur and inc and forbes and and that sort of type of thing being a non-fiction book um and uh you know then it comes down to obviously the email list a nice campaign going in on that uh, my kind of inner circle of the Upano community, which is, you know, 600 plus strong people who will be more than happy to spread the word about the book and, and hopefully buy a couple of copies each for their friends and things like that. And so, you know, I, I feel pretty confident that we're going to have a, a good launch, but it's not just about the launch. You know, it's also making sure that we continue to get the word out there uh, after that initial push, obviously. Yeah, but it certainly helps, particularly if you get some um, some visibility uh, with the launch for the longevity, a bit of chart placement. So let me unpick a couple yes. of those things. You talk about the campaigns. What what specifically in terms of paid advertising? You go for social media advertising. Have you got um, some older world advertising? No, no, no old world stuff. Um, but but yes, we will have a Facebook uh, campaign in place for everything from uh, our VIP. Uh, launch list which we're putting together currently right now the target for that is a strong 500 people um, and we're already at 100 plus with hardly any effort at all which is great um, you know these you know that that 500 people they're they're the people that you know I'm gonna be like 
buy 10 copies of the book. Buy 10 copies of the book, give it out to all your friends and, uh, you know, help me out sort of type thing. You know what I mean? Um, and so we, we have that. So we'll definitely retarget people on Facebook with that. Uh, well, we're going to be doing a, a certain amount of live video. I'm actually going to be taking people on the journey of the second book uh, a little bit as of the beginning of, of, of February um, and doing a couple of Facebook Lives on my page each week, talking about the different decisions that I made, what I did, how I did it, um, doing some Q&As and things like that. Because again, youpreneurs should all be publishing a book. If they're, if they're not planning to already, they should start planning it. And so it's also great learning and training content for my tribe as well to see how I put it together, um, why I put it together the way I have, and then obviously how I'm going to market it and get it out there. So uh, we'll be doing a lot of that stuff. But no, I mean, we're not we're not dropping thousands and thousands of dollars or anything or, or on, on that side of things. But yes, there is a there's a campaign in there, a very solid email marketing campaign as well. I'm blessed to have a good list that actually opened my emails. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll be leaning on that quite heavily as well. Yeah. This is why we do all the work, James. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is why you know, you know, it's been four years since the last book. What do you think I've been doing for four years? Twiddling my thumbs? No, I've been, I've been, you know, grinding away like any good youpreneur should. Yeah, and of course, this is the heart of what SPF talks about and and teaches as well. And I really, it really stands out uh, in this book that the monetization process if you're watching on, on video, comes about there in the book. So two thirds of the way in, do you start thinking about how you're going to make money? And, and I think a lot of people, when they first come into the self-publishing sphere, it takes them a while to understand that this is a long game, that you're building up a loyal audience, you're building up yourself, you're building up, you're turning your casual observers into fans and some fans into super fans. And then down the road, after you've given quite a lot away and built that up, you can start making some money. Don't expect to make money at the end of the first week when you've published. Um, and that's, you, you mm. basically, that's, that's why I think when I read this book, I think the biggest single group of youpreneurs in the world are self-published authors. Without a doubt. Like I said, there is no better embodiment of a youpreneur as a self-published author. There honestly truly isn't because particularly in the non-fiction space, which is really my kind of focus from a client perspective, is authors are not just authors. They're also consultants or coaches or potentially speakers. Uh, they should have online courses. They should have membership communities. Um, they should have, you know, mastermind events or high-end coaching. They should do all these things that we talk about inside of that youpreneur ecosystem which is you know the heart and soul of that monetization section of the book um, but likewise though you know I've, I've been saying to people as I've talked to them uh, you know what if if you're already sort of done building your business skip the first 75 pages of the book don't waste your time I mean I'd love to think everybody's going to read it pay you know cover to cover but the chances are that you don't need to if you've already got your website up and running properly if your social media is set up properly and not automated with robots left right and center if you know who you are what you want to be known for what your skill set is if you're self-aware uh you know in terms of your strengths and your weaknesses and you're building on your strengths rather than worrying about the weaknesses if you know who your perfect customer is you don't need to read the first 75 pages of the book you can skip to the marketing section and therefore obviously onto the monetization section as well yeah how far can this transition go, do you think, Chris? You personally know thousands of people who have quit their nine to five and started a making money in their pajamas, uh, for want of a better expression. Um, clearly, not everyone in the world can do this, and there still needs to be factories producing things. Um, and I sometimes wonder, because we talk to each other quite a lot, it perhaps exaggerates how many people are thinking about this or doing this, but it does seem to feel to me like a change, a fairly fundamental change in the way the economies are going to be working in the future. And you know, the, the funny thing is, is that this is nothing new. This has been going on for quite some time. I mean, not decades or anything, but a good, a good five to 10 years. This has been an actual, genuine, real, profitable business model. And a lot of the gurus, a lot of the money people and all the rest of it, career pros they didn't see it they didn't see it coming i saw it coming in 2012 i jumped right off and right into it so 
I, I think it I think it will continue to grow. Clearly, it's going to continue to grow because there's people like you and I that are out there pitching it as a viable option for you know career opportunity and money making opportunity and a whole bunch of other stuff, right? So it'll continue to grow. But you're absolutely right. Factories are still going to need to be manned. Uh, you know, uh, supermarkets are still going to need stuff put on their shelves, and uh, you know. F- chemists are still going to need pharmacy you know pharmacists behind the counter i mean it, it is what it is uh, but i i think that um i think that things are going to evolve actually very rapidly in the next 10 years in regards to this kind of sphere and i think that ultimately uh, we'll see a little bit of a uh, a little bit of a plateauing after that period of time for a bit um, I mean, my daughter is 19. She's studying um, at university in London right now, uh, business communications and marketing, you know, kind of a focus on marketing. And, uh, you know, she said to me, she was at the Upreneur Summit, um, and she said to me after the event, she said, you know, Dad, uh, this is what I want to do. You know, when I'm done and I've got my degree, this is what I want to do. I want to do this. And I'm like, well, you know, you're going to have to earn your stripes. You can't just start putting on events. And, you know, she goes, I want to do this with you. I want to learn from you and work with you because clearly you've got it kind of figured out. Now, do I have it all figured out? No, (laughs) but I'm happy for my daughter to sort of see me as a little bit of a hero. That's great, obviously. Uh, But clearly, as a millennial, right, you're going to see this more and more and more. And by golly, I mean, if I had all the opportunities that she has today when I was her age, oh my gosh, God knows what I could have done, you know? I mean, I've done well, but God knows what I could have done, yeah. you know, with all that at my fingertips, literally, or my thumb tips, <laughs> one or the other. I'd be very interested to know uh, how much of, of what she's being taught at university in London um, was... <laughs> resonated when she was at the Upreneur Summit or did she stand there thinking we're not learning any of this stuff and yet this is a massive movement there is there is a yeah, lag that, isn't there exactly and yet I'm I'm happy to pay nine grand a year for yeah. it go figure right <laughs> I mean um <laughs> I just keep saying one and a bit years left yes. one a bit one yes. and a bit years yeah. left you know um I think you know you know there's definitely stuff I mean you know she has called me up we've FaceTimed and we've you know had many a dinner and, and lunch and everything over certain things that she would like me to help her with uh, presentation wise and you know uh, you know helping her with her presentation skills particularly uh in front of the class and, and that that is great because it's P to P, it's people to people. That's the way I live and breathe in in my world. And so she's learning how to ultimately pitch herself, pitch her ideas, pitch uh, you know her ideals to people. I love that. I think that's great. But when they're teaching her in a marketing communications uh, you know degree course how to you know build a website in Dreamweaver. Like I'm shaking my freaking head, James. I'm like, Dreamweaver? Didn't that die yeah. like a <laughs> decade ago? Kind of thing, you know. So you know, there is there is a disconnect. There's overlap for sure, uh, but there's a disconnect. But again, these kids, they're so darn in tune with everything because of social, because of you know that kind of ever connected world that they live in. Um, that I, I mean, I I'm not, I don't fear for her at all. Right. Even if she wasn't at university. I would not be fearing for her yeah. at all. You know, a younger brother and sister, um, they might not even end up going to university. Yet I know if their heads are screwed on right and their hard workers are going to do just fine. Yeah, no, I feel the same about my, my children as well. And uh, uh, there is a disconnect. I was listening, something happened a couple of weeks ago and the, you know, you got all these stats on the radio about the economy and so on. most of it floats by me and I try to take a long view rather than get involved in the day-to-day <clears throat> anxieties. But there was one stat when I heard this economic guy on Radio 4 here in the UK talking about it. It, it was He said, there's a curious thing is that the economy's growing, uh, more people are in employment than ever before, and yet productivity in the UK is down and they can't explain it. And they've been 
masking it for a while. So the chance has been able to stay stand up in the House of Commons in the UK and say, we've made an adjustment because we think this is a hangover from the recession. Well, the last time he stood up, he said, we're not making that adjustment anymore. We cannot explain why productivity is going down. And I'm thinking, do you know what? That just does not resonate with my experience of this country at the moment. I'm looking around thinking, I'm working harder than I've ever worked before. We're making money. All my friends are working long hours. Why is productivity going down? So I had a little dig into it. And it turns out their measurement of productivity is looking at the GDP of the country divided by output. Well, what do they consider output? You look at what they consider output. It's making rubber ducks in factories in the Midlands. They've literally no idea what I'm doing. I don't figure it on their radar. Completely absolutely. No wonder they think productivity is going down. They're measuring the wrong things. They're measuring industry that's 100 years old. Um, anyway, I didn't phone in to Radio 4 rant about it, but I thought I'd mention it to you. So there is... A d- you bloody should have, <laughs> by the sound of it. That would have been great. No, but, you know, when I'm in the UK, and, you know, I'm moving back there in June, as you know, after 17 years of, of being over here in the Philippines, and just before Brexit all kicks off, so clearly I'm not worried in any way, shape, or form about that. But it's like when I'm back there and I see the big, you know, the, the the small business bus from that west floating around and, you know, entrepreneur this and and small business this, clearly the UK has become or is becoming a nation of entrepreneurial types or is becoming more entrepreneurial over recent years. So I see it as just a massive, massive opportunity, uh, particularly for me as as a, a you know, a, a coach and a mentor. I, I feel like I'm I'm gonna be, you know, pretty set as long as I uh, as long as I continue to keep the value and the consistency up there. So I mean it's it's a strange market, the UK particularly, but you're right, they're clearly out of touch. I mean do we really need to do any research to understand that you know p- politicians are out of touch? No, I, no. I don't think we need to worry about that. <laughs> and, the, and the thing is, I think they know that as well. I think the savvy politicians have this understanding that they don't quite have a grasp on how things are changing, how quickly they're changing, but they don't know what to do about it. And there, there is the, the expression you can uh, you can give to almost every large corporation. They don't sit there stuck in their old ways because um, they're ignorant. They sit there stuck in old ways because they don't know how to change and they don't know how to yes. be agile. Well, that's the beauty of the industry that we're in. Um, and particularly, as you say, and this comes across in, in what you talk about, is that if you've made yourself your business, there's nothing more agile than you, because we evolve naturally anyway. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. It doesn't matter who you're serving, what product or service you're selling or marketing. It's actually all of that becomes completely and utterly irrelevant in terms of the potential of your business growth because with you being the very real unique aspect of your business overall you ultimately future proof yourself you uncopyable yourself there's no real competitors because people will be doing business with you because you are their favorite right that's what i always talk about become somebody's favorite if you do that as your interests kind of morph and change and pivot they will go with you as long as you continue to provide value and show that you give a damn, quite frankly. Um, and I think that that is why this this model of youpreneurship, as I call it, obviously you can call it what you want, but I'll call it the name that I gave it. Um, I believe that youpreneurial model is the best business model for anybody with any level of experience or passion under their belt going forward. Yeah. And if you think about it, if you've built a good, as an author, fiction author, you might be writing romance or science fiction or nonfiction, you've built a good active list, you're engendering a loyalty in your fans and that's growing, that will survive Brexit, that will survive, or you'd have to worry about Absolutely. who's in the White House um, because you've got this thing that proofs you against uh, all those changes, as you say. So Yeah, I mean, even even fiction, even fiction writers, I am not a fiction writer. I've never written a piece of fiction before. I, I will never say never, um, but I have no plans on doing any kind of fiction work currently. But even fiction authors can monetize their experience as a fiction author. And I mean, if, if you have one or two books under your belt already that have done even remotely okay in terms of sales and distribution and you're not you know holding some kind of writer's retreat or workshop or something along those lines not only to 
monetize but also to grow your hardcore kind of raving fan base if you're not doing that you're leaving a lot more on the table than just money you're leaving huge opportunity on the table um and you know we've only got so many years right and time is our most valuable commodity so it's something that we should invest very very wisely and i think there's just as many opportunities as fiction writers as there are non-fiction writers yeah absolutely um just bringing it back to your book and your non-fiction experience uh I, we had an interview a few weeks ago, which I've recorded as yet to go out with uh, an Australian guy who wrote a story about his father. And I was talking to him about the marketing difference between fiction and nonfiction. He said his nonfiction is, is slightly acute you know, and, and angled marketing, i.e. every time he appears on the radio, every time he writes an article in a magazine, every time he guest blogs, sales of his books go up. And I think in nonfiction, that's how it works. And that's sort of what you said to me earlier. This is, this is not direct marketing, this book it will grow with you organically when you grow your own brand. And I think that might be a difference between fiction and nonfiction marketing. Very possibly, yeah. And I mean, clearly, you know, once you get yourself onto 15 or so decent podcasts within a space um, and the host of that podcast is saying, this is a great book, go and pick it up, everybody. Smart Money says you're going to sell a load of copies of your book, you know. Uh, I mean, you know, I had Lewis Howes uh, do the foreword for Rise of the Youpreneur, and Lewis is on in a ridiculous upward trajectory right now. He's been on the Ellen show, and he's hanging out with all these big celebrities and all the rest of it. This and, is an eight-figure you know, man. Oh, yes. And, I mean, you know, Lewis, Lewis is... And when I reached out to him, yes, we're friends, but when I reached out to him, I said, you are the personal brand entrepreneur personified. People flock to you, not because of your content, but because of you, you're magnetic. And then they fall in love with you even more when you help them through struggles or you know figuring out what business to operate and all that kind of stuff. And so um, you know it helps to have that kind of name attached to the book, obviously, but clearly if he can do it, anyone can do it. This isn't, you know, this isn't just for, you know, handsome six foot three ex, you know, uh, footballers in America. You know what I mean? Like this, this, anyone can, look, I'm a middle-aged bald guy from London. If I can do it, (laughs) anyone can do it. You know what I mean? It's, it's, It's not rocket science. It's just about figuring out who you are, what you want to be known for who you want to help and sell and serve and uh, and then going out and doing some great stuff. That's cri- simple, really. That's great, Chris. And if people want a bit more personal help from you, can you explain how your community works and how people can learn from you? So yeah, the Youpreneur community is, you know, it, it's it's an important mainstay in my own Youpreneur ecosystem, meaning it's predictable income and it's recurring income, whether it be a monthly subscription recurring for some members or an annual for others. Um, and obviously, you know, we we want to continue to grow that and grow that and grow that over time. Now, I'm in there once or twice a week, tapping away on the keyboard, answering questions and firing off replies to people's ideas and problems and things like that. And then we do a one hour live mastermind call every single month, which usually goes actually to about an hour and a half or so, where anybody can kind of come on live and grill me in any way, shape or form about building the personal brand business. Um, But that's only one facet of the way that my clients work with me as a mentor and coach. You know, we 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 recently launched at the end of last year my uh, round table mastermind, and you know, I'm a big fan of all things British, King Arthur, and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to go with the round table. We're going to use the King Arthur font on the logo. It's going to be great. And um, you know, we opened the doors, and and we had over. 50 applications literally within the space of a week we picked the 12 people that are going to be at the table and um you know i'm now going to be working with those people for an entire year so it's a year-long commitment it ain't cheap it's a couple of grand a month um but you know they get a ridiculous amount of access to me uh, but they also get 
a lot of access to everybody else, which is actually the more important aspect here, rather than me, quite frankly, because they they really do get the opportunity to hang out with people that are at the same level, that get it, that need the accountability, that are going to be there to offer the support. Um, and, you know, I think uh, probably the average income of somebody in the round table is around £300,000 a year. At per annum, right? So, whereas people inside of the Upano community, you know, will be floating anywhere between, you know, mid five figures a year, maybe sometimes a little lower, but sometimes a little higher. Uh, but that's generally, you know, the, the two different kind of options from a coaching and a mentorship perspective. But then obviously we do our live events, there's workshops, there's the Upano Summit, which is now going to become the flagship event every year. So there's all these little things in the ecosystem that we've built up over time, along with some courses, along with some services and you know all that sort of stuff as well. It's fun. This stuff's fun. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it is fun. You obviously thrive on it. And I mean quite labor intensive for you, this model. I mean you move, you you set up the older businesses and then step back from the very Tim Ferris uh, way of doing things um, and reap the benefits of that. But here you seem to be building yourself into quite a lot of your income streams. Well, I mean, you know, the membership, look, the membership's a good money maker, James, you know, and it's only going to continue to grow in terms of the Upano community itself. I spend no more than two, oh, maybe an hour and a half a week inside of the forums and it's a pleasure i don't even look at it as work half the time i'm sitting there with a bowl of cornflakes doing it you know what i mean um and you know and then obviously with the round table they get a couple of hours a month uh, of group mentoring and then we actually meet three times a year in a two-day retreat and that's where the real magic will happen with that particular group because it's those kind of people so you know it might sound like it's super heavy kind of labor intensive from my perspective but it's actually really not and i think that you know you know the, you mentioned tim first the way he kind of got out of the whole well tim surely you must be working more than four hours a week well, it depends on what you call work. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's how he got out of that. So, you know, I don't I don't really look at it genuinely. I don't really look at it as work. I, I look at it as doing what I feel genuinely I have been put here to do, and that is to help other people build extremely profitable businesses over a period of time. Um, I like doing it. They're my kind of people. And like I said, I'm very, very happy with it. But you know, there, there, there are, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the background in terms of that ecosystem with services and courses and upsells and affiliates and all that kind of stuff that we do as well, which is very, very passive, uh, and obviously makes me, you know, some good income every year as well. Yeah, great. I, I hope at the end of the 12 months of the round table, you have a sword that you can knight people with. That'd be good. That'd be, I tell you, that's good. Yeah. I like that idea. I want to see maybe that. maybe that will be a little. Uh, that'll be maybe a little a little giveaway for everybody at the end of the 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 end of the year or something. We'll we'll get some made up or something. Yeah, just check know. that people can fly with them though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Right. We'll get everyone arrested. Right. A, yeah. uh, right, Stick that, don't, don't leave it in your hand, Carrie, whatever you do, right? <laughs> Chris, it's um, it's been fantastic talking to you. Really good luck with the book. We're going to be, I've got, I'll dial up in a minute after this and find out exactly when this is going to go out, but hopefully it's about the time of the, of the book launch and we'll watch that with interest. But I think uh, the main reason that we're excited to get you back on is, is you speak directly to self-published authors who are building a business based around themselves, making money in their pajamas, the ultimate youpreneurs, and uh, I, I'm absolutely certain that we're going to have a close relationship in the future because uh, this, these go hand in hand what you talk what you talk about and what we're trying to do go hand in hand yeah it's good stuff and uh, you know i hope that uh, if people do pick up the book they get lots from it and if they have any questions by the way very seriously hit me up on twitter you know at chris ducker i'm always uh, you know whenever you get a reply there it's always me personally my team manages a lot of my social media but on twitter uh, it is always me replying so that's the place to get a personal reply if anybody has any kind of questions or whatever just like donald trump just it's like always him trump as we can tell yeah it's definitely yes. always him <laughs> okay great chris thank you so much indeed good luck with your move back to the uk and uh, i look forward to that pint in cambridge at some point Yes, mate. I appreciate it. There you go. Um, I mean, it's it, when you hear Chris talking, you do get quite excited about this new world that wasn't available really to our parents, was it? 
No, God, no, it wasn't available to us until about 10 years ago. So this is still, in the grand scheme of things, a relatively um, recent innovation. Um, and yeah, he, he certainly is um, enthusiastic. And um, I'll tell a, a little anecdote. When uh, James and my wife Lucy went to, to the Upreneur conference, I did get a text at some point. Um, which was there's dancing, um, and the <laughs> I, I did have the image of James being called onto stage, and uh, with that that famous um, British reserve, and being asked <laughs> to shed that, and possibly items of clothes, and and um, and surrender to the moment. But as far as I know, that that didn't happen. Um, no, so no, it didn't happen. For the for the, S, for the inevitable SVF conference, that is my aim. Yeah, to get James dancing on stage. Naked. No, you can't. Um, you okay. can't accuse Chris Ducker of having a, a classic British reserve. He doesn't have that. And the conference he had, which was excellent, and I've got a long list of actions uh, that immediately followed that conference. And I've had two meetings with people who I met at the conference. Subsequently, we keep sort of keeping each other honest in, in our motivation of where we're going and so on. It was a really good conference, but there were moments when people were dancing on stage when I stood next to your wife saying. This is not for me, this bit. Yeah, it wouldn't be for me either. But there you go. But, you know, horses for courses and all that. Yeah, and Joe Penn spoke at that conference, actually. She spoke very well at it. And there were quite a few, as I say, every... They did what we do with our podcast. We try to make sure that everyone's worth listening to and there's some takeaways. Otherwise, it's just wasting everyone's time. So every speaker brought something there. And uh, there were some famous names, like Pat Flynn and so on there. There were takeaways. There were takeaways. There was takeaways. There was beer, which, of course. <laughs> Okay, if you want to know more about the book, um, chrisducker.com, we gave the URL in the interview. And as I'm standing here, I can't remember exactly what that URL was. I'm sure you heard it. But uh, chrisducker.com, I noticed you can get through to a landing page. And as uh, as I'm speaking at this second, it's a wait list for the book, but I think it's going to be launched about the time this interview uh, goes out. Um, and it's uh, yeah, I know, it's exciting. I enjoy talking to Chris. He is uh, he's a slightly eccentric character, but that's uh, the best of the British are eccentric. I think living abroad when you're British must make you more eccentric. And he's become as a lot of Union Jack wearing goes on with him. I, although I do have, in fact, we noticed in the interview we have exactly the same uh, telephone, our Union Jack telephone. I'm a proud <laughs> I'm a proud Brit too. Yeah, I gather that there's a RAF Roundel in shot behind you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Good. Okay. Look, Mark, um, thank you very much indeed uh, for today. You can relax. I hope you enjoy Tenerife next week. Yeah, I'm relaxing. Yeah, hopes, hopefully as soon as we're um, off the plane, that will be the, uh, it's the small matter of a, a four-year-old on a five-hour flight that we need to negotiate first of all. Once that's done, I think we, we generally picked up from the airport, taken to the hotel, and I won't be leaving the hotel for a week. So, uh, yeah, yes, good. I'll, be, I'll be incommunicado-ish for, for a few days. Okay, well, you enjoy that. Don't forget that we have our course, uh, that is uh, Stuart Bache's course, which is uh, available at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash design, uh, a detailed instructional course on designing your own course covers. It's uh, from a highly regarded professional in the industry. And if you got uh, the inclination to support us at Patreon, SPF, uh, sorry, patreon.com forward slash SPF podcast, you've got a few days left to be in with a mug. If you're a gold level subscriber after that, it's going to be a pin. Thank you very much indeed for listening. There's a mug on screen now if you're watching on YouTube. Thank you very much indeed. Have a great week. We'll speak to you next week. Bye bye. You've been listening to the Self Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.